Hello, I want to go over the practice test with you. Um, first couple of problems went pretty smoothly. We want to say that every natural number, so we're going to call that n. So that would be for all, whoops, for all n in the natural's numbers is less than some real number. So we need to name that real number. Let's call that x some real number, we're saying there is some real number that it's less than. So we're saying there exists an x in the real numbers. And we want n to be less than x. So that should do it. Okay, remember we had to name each of those variables and either a universal or an existential quantifier. In this case, for every positive real number x, remember a nice shorthand is x greater than zero, there is a distance epsilon there exists an epsilon. Distances have to be greater than zero. We don't really need that. We could say epsilon and r, and the statement would be fine, such that all real, all positive real numbers, that one needs a name. So for all y greater than zero are less than that distance from x. The distance of that number from x is the absolute value of y minus x, and distance less than epsilon would be written like this. Okay, so now we're looking at the set of all real numbers whose square is less than 4. There's a much simpler way to say that, right? If x squared is less than 4, then x is between minus 2 and 2. We're claiming that every number is less than 3. Um, true, because 2 is less than 3, right? Everything that's in this set is less than 2, so it's certainly less than 3. Um, for all epsilon, the epsilon ball around 1 half is contained in 0, 1. So here's 0, 1. 1 half is right in between. And if the epsilon ball is small, then of course that's true. But if the epsilon ball is big, it's false. So as long as epsilon is bigger than one half, this will be false. So our counterexample is epsilon equals one. That's plenty to write. So question three, I want you to notice that what I did was break down a piece of the limit definition. For any epsilon, find a real number k so that if n in the natural numbers is bigger than k, then 2 to the minus n is less than epsilon. Okay? That's the kind of thing you would need to do to write a proof of a limit of sequence converging, but I'm not asking, I'm only asking you to do that one piece. So if you need 2 to the minus epsilon to be less, 2 to the minus n to be less than epsilon, that's the same thing as saying 2 to the n is greater than 1 over epsilon, everything's positive, which is the same thing as saying that n times the natural log of 2 is greater than the natural log of 1 over epsilon. Or a simpler thing to do is to take the log base 2. The log base 2 of 2 to the n is n is greater than the log base 2 of 1 over epsilon. If you want to be fancy, you can write that as minus log base 2 of epsilon. And you're done. This relies, of course, on the fact that the exponential function and log are increasing so that they preserve order. Question 4 is a substantial proof. Given, we're given that the sequence xn converges to x, we want to prove that the sequence 5xn converges to 5x. Okay, so you know how to start. Let epsilon be greater than 0. Define k equals. Here, I'm going to leave a little more space because I know where I'm headed here. And then we're going to let n be greater than k. We want to conclude that 5xn minus 5x is less than epsilon. 
what do we know? We know that xn converges to x. So we know, I'm going to write in my scratch paper on red, um, and in the interest of, of space and convenience, I'm going to put my scratch paper on the test. But you should write this on scratch paper. So I know I can um, choose k1 so that for all n greater than k1, xn minus x is less than epsilon 1. Those may be epsilon or may not be. So if I make k equal to that k1, then I can make this be true. I want to make this be true. So I just have to work from here backwards to here. And that's pretty clear how you would do that, right? If 5xn minus 5x, an absolute value is less than epsilon, I can pull out the 5, which is positive, And I get xn minus x is less than epsilon over 5. And that's it. So um, I can just choose k so that if n is greater than k, then xn minus x is less than epsilon over 5. That's because xn converges to x. That guarantees there is such a k no matter what epsilon is, including epsilon over 5. So if n is greater than k, that is exactly what we need to know that xn minus x is less than epsilon over 5. And then we're done. One thing to notice here is that in the book, there is a proof that any constant times a convergent sequence converges to the constant times the limit. So if you looked at that proof, you had a sense of how this should go. But if you didn't, this is a pretty straightforward using one thing converges to prove that another thing converges. That is an important fundamental skill that I wanted you to have and that we, we modeled. It's a complicated one, but it's an important one. Okay. Um, prove that n factorial is less than or equal to n to the n. That is naturally an induction statement. If you did not guess that it was an induction statement, this inductive re uh, recursive definition of n plus one, n factorial, should suggest it. So, how do we do an inductive argument? We start with the base case, which is n equals one. One factorial is one, which is less than or equal to one to the one. Check. Then we assume our inductive hypothesis n factorial is less than or equal to n to the n. If you like doing k's here, that's great. To prove n plus 1 factorial is less than or equal to n plus 1 to the n plus 1. Um, again, my scratch paper here. I know that I'm going to want to use n plus 1 factorial is equal to n plus 1 times n factorial. If I plug that into the thing I'm trying to prove, I get that n plus 1 times n factorial is less than or equal to n plus 1 to the n plus 1, which is n plus 1 times n plus 1 to the n. So now I see all I need to prove is that n factorial is less than n plus 1 to the n, but I know that n factorial is less than or equal to, sorry, less than or equal to n to the n, and clearly, n to the n is less than or equal to n plus 1 to the n. Again, that relies on the um, raising to a positive power being order preserving. That requires some argument, but I'm happy to have you just remember that from your calc 1 when you graphed those things. Um, and you can always check with me if you're not sure you can assume something. So how does that proof go? We start at the beginning n factorial is less than or equal to n to the n. n to the n is less than or equal to n plus 1 to the n. So n factorial is less than or equal to n plus 1 to the n. <clears throat> n plus 1 times n factorial is less than or equal to n plus 1 
times n plus 1 to the n, which means that n plus 1 factorial is less than or equal to n plus 1 to the n plus 1. Okay. You, of course, cannot see the scratch paper motivation, so it's hard to tell how this proof was thought of, but if you try reading it, it's easy to tell that each thing follows from the last, which is the important thing in a proof. Okay, and finally, um, prove that this converges using the limit definition. So we know how to start this out. This is what we want to prove. Um, what does it converge to? So I'm going to figure that out in scratch paper. 2 to the n, 2 to the 2 times n squared over n squared plus 1. When n is very large, we can throw away that plus 1 because it's much smaller than n squared. So we get this is becomes 2n squared over 1n squared, which is 2 over 1, which is 2. So the limit is going to be 2. <clears throat> and then in my scratch paper, I'm going to take 2n squared over n squared plus 1 minus 2. I'm going to combine those terms, 2n squared minus 2 times n squared plus 1 over n squared plus 1. This becomes 2n squared minus 2n squared minus 2 over n squared plus 1, which becomes minus 2 over n squared plus 1, which is 2 over n squared plus 1. So we just need to make 2 over n squared plus 1 be less than epsilon, you can try and unwind this in terms of, to get n in terms of epsilon, but it's easiest to notice that 2 over n squared plus 1 is less than 2 over n squared, right? Because we've made the denominator smaller, so we've made the whole thing bigger, but 2 over n squared is still going to 0. So if you want 2 over n squared to be less than epsilon, then you want 2 over epsilon to be greater than n, or less than n squared, sorry, which means you want n to be greater than the square root of 2 over epsilon. So k is square root of 2 over epsilon. If n is greater than k, n is greater than square root of 2 over epsilon. n squared is greater than 2 over epsilon. Epsilon is greater than 2 over n squared. Epsilon is greater than the absolute value of negative 2 over n squared plus 1. Um, which equals 2n squared over n squared plus 1 minus 2, and we're done. Okay. Notice I skipped a number of algebra steps. If you're confident you've done the algebra correctly, you can be pretty fluid with that, particularly if your scratch paper is nearby. But in any case, um, I'm going to trust you that you know how to do reasonable amounts of algebra, you should be a little more detailed about the inequalities because that's pretty new. That's the test. If you didn't do so well on the test, remember, first of all, my grading system means it does not matter. Um, and everybody, I believe, the light will come on. Before the light comes on, you're going to get kind of crappy grades. It's okay. Keep doing the homework. Um, uh, and um, keep working on it, and you will get there. Here are some suggestions about what you can do differently if it didn't work so well. Um, one is use scratch paper, and here I mean scratch paper. If you try to write your thoughts in a blank piece of paper, you won't, because the blank piece of paper feels wasteful to say wrong things on. If you use paper that's already been written on or printed on, scrap paper you were going to throw away, you will feel comfortable writing stupid things. And that's what scratch paper is for. 
You write a lot of stupid things, and then when you understand what you're doing, you write the final version. And then that understand what you're doing is something I really want to emphasize. You learn math by doing, but doing isn't math. You have Math is understanding. So you have to do until you get the doing kind of working, and then you have to think and understand what it means. And in each of these things, you know, particularly in real analysis, you need to stop and think about what am I trying to convince the reader is true? How can I convince them? You know, the rules of the game are you have to start with things that you know are true and argue by things you can defend to something that you want to be true. Um, but you also can never stop using your intuition about what is this statement saying about the objects involved? Is it true or not? Um, and that's a kind of hard discipline that you've got to keep practicing when you're doing problems. Um, the other thing I want to suggest to you is that um, when you're working on the problem set, start early, get stuck. And if you can't get yourself unstuck, ask me. One of the great ways to learn this is to get stuck, have someone unstick you, get a little further, have them unstick you, and each time when you get stuck and find the answer, sometimes you'll get yourself unstuck. Think about it. Think about what you were stuck on. Think about what you didn't know that got you stuck. Think about what you had to be told or realize to get unstuck. And view that as something that you have learned and that you now understand better. If you keep doing that, this will all start to make sense and it will start to seem pretty easy. But you gotta, you gotta put in the hours to make that happen. Okay, I will see you guys on Thursday. Let's see if I can turn off this video.